All right, and in this chapter, um, I'll be presenting on Poisson negative binomial regression. Um, just to check, is this font size okay with everyone? Just give a thumbs up or let me know if not. All right, cool. I'm just learning something. You can change the font size directly? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so just let me know if you need me to zoom up. Um, <laughs> You know what annoys me is that you can't get rid of all this white space. I feel like that's just taking up too much real estate. But anyways, our markdown is still good. I love it. Um, okay, so we'll be covering. I um, think there is an option to go 69. I, will, I don't know where, but I think you have an option I like can chat. Maybe someone can find it. But I think you can go 69. There is an option to do that. Oh, okay. But yeah, I understand. Yeah, I'll look into that later then. Um, but for today, we'll cover the following learning objectives. So last week, we'll walk this through um, extending regression to account for categorical predictors. And today, we'll be borrowing some of those concepts, except extending our normal regression model further into the generalized linear model, specifically discussing Poisson and negative binomial models. Um, and I think this will provide a really good foundation since it introduces the log link function to understanding logistic regression more, which I think is prevalent in pretty much every field. And so this will provide a good foundation. Um, and as with every chapter, um, they start with a sort of case study or a toy data set. Um, last week, I don't think it was very applicable to any of us looking at temperature in um, cities in Australia, um, but this one um, will be analyzing anti-discrimination laws in the United States. And of course, I feel like everyone's always paying attention to politics in the US. Um, specifically, we're gonna look at factors that are associated with a greater number of anti-discrimination laws. Um, the two predictors we're interested in are demographic features, specifically the percentage of state residents that live in an urban area or in the city area, and to see if that's associated with more anti-discrimination laws and political climate. And we're gonna operationalize this by looking at the voting history of these states. So states could either traditionally vote blue or Democrat, um, Republican, so they could historically be a red state or a swing state. So they um, swing between being red or blue. Um, and just to provide a bit more credibility to this example, um, even though it might seem like a toy example, which it is of course, um, I don't think a study would, could ever be published that just looked at the number of anti-discrimination laws as a way of quantifying you know, how anti-discriminatory a state is. Um, it, I have found some articles that try to operationalize and quantify it in this way. So um, it is um, something that still may be relevant to people, say, if you're in political science. Um, so the way we can try tackling this is to model this with a regression model that has a normal data structure. So what we've learned thus far. Um, and that's illustrated here. So our mean is um, equal to this linear combination of all of our predictors plus the intercepts. Um, for this example, um, our dependent variable is the number of anti-discrimination laws. Our first predictor is the percentage of um, residents that live in an urban area. And then um, our categorical variable will be um, whether they've historically been red, blue, or swing state. And as we learned last time, um, we, when we're working with categorical predictors, we need a reference variable. So what we're essentially doing is um, having several slopes, and then we're comparing um, our GOP or Republican slope to our Democrat slope. So um, the Democrats will be, or historically Democrat states will be our reference variable in this case. Um, and um, our third variable um, will be comparing swing states to Democrat states. Um, so the usual process is to look at some descriptive stats. So right off the bat, we can see that it is a right tail skewed distribution, um, but we're still gonna try and apply normal regression just because so we can see the consequences. Um, and then we're also gonna look at um, the scatter plot here. So we see um, we can already tell that um, historically blue states um, tend to have um, way more anti-discriminatory laws 
uh, compared to swing states and red or GOP states. Uh, GOP stands for Grand Old Party, by the way, um, but it's Republican. Uh, so we can try fitting our normal regression model, and these are the results we get. Um, so here, um, the one in dark blue is our actual data set, and the rest of these are five um, simulated posterior predictive checks. Um, and as is pretty evident, um, the distributions we get from our model are quite different from the actual data set. Um, and so we'll investigate why in more depth um, in the next page. So we'll start by talking a bit more about the Poisson regression model and what it is. So it's used for modeling a discrete number of events, or we'll also call these count variables um, that occur in a fixed interval of space or time. Um, theoretically, there's no upper limit. Um, and as you can see from our data set, they tend to be right tail skewed. Um, for our Poisson data model, um, well, here, I don't think it's looking at LGBTQ plus specifically, so I'll, I, I'll delete that later. Um, but looking at the number of laws in each state. Um, and then for all of our Poisson regression, we have what's called this rate parameter that's commonly denoted by lambda, um, as well as um, our predictors. So in this case, demographic and voting trends. Um, just to talk a bit more about the rate parameter, um, this tries to quantify how often our given event occurs within a fixed interval, whether that's space or time. Um, but anyways, backtracking to the normal linear regression model, um, we're gonna compare and contrast these two now. So you can see here that this is what the normal linear regression model looks like. And so um, we have our categorical variables in which the slopes are all parallel to each other. And we see how they're associated um, with the number of laws um, with percent, percentage of urban residents on the um, x-axis. Um, and so this is what it looks like for a normal regression model. Um, the problem um, is that we're assuming that um, the rate of anti-discrimination laws is a linear combination of the predictors. Um, but by using this model, um, lambda or a rate can span both positive and negative values, which suggests that states can have a negative number of anti-discrimination laws which I guess theoretically could be a thing. Like you can have um, pretty discriminatory laws, um, but of course, for this case, it, it doesn't actually make sense. Certainly for other use cases, it wouldn't. Um, so what's the answer to this problem? Um, well, it's to use the log link function, which is really just taking the log of our lambda or rate parameter that we're trying to model. Um, at least for me, this is sort of like, um, when I first learned about it, sort of just like a clever hack to put it on a linear scale. Um, however, um, that we'll be using, we'll get very familiar with the log link function in other contexts soon. Um, so we can interpret the log number of laws, um, even though it, it's a bit harder or not as straightforward so as normal regression. There, it's a uh, Nepalian logarithm. It's best. Uh, Sorry, because I, I, I found it very like this hard to figure out because like this is not a, because at least in France the log is used to bus 10 or bus 2 and this uh, appear to be the Nuclean one like the LN one traditional because like this is when you reverse it it's become exponential no yeah I, I, I never know which one I just always confuse them yeah, so if I'm answering your question, right? Yeah, they assume it's to base E. So Euler's number. Base E, okay. Yeah. So, okay, just clarifying for myself. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think R assumes this too, right? Like when you do, when you do EX function. I always have to check like the manual page. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, no, that's what the documentation's there for. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Um, so here in this diagram, um, it's the log number of laws, which as you can tell, um, makes things linear. Um, on the right is the number of laws in the state with the uh, urban percentage and historical voting trends. Because um, if it's not taken on that log scale, it looks like this. 
So now we'll we'll spend quite a bit of time, I think, interpreting the regression coefficients. Um, maybe we'll practice a few together. Um, but I think that's pretty important. Um, again, for um, not just Poisson, but negative binomial and um, logistic regression, we'll have to be quite familiar with how to interpret these coefficients the right way. Um, and so these two formulations of uh, the Poisson regression are equivalent, or they're statistically equivalent. But as people in this room I pro probably know, um, statistical equivalence doesn't always mean practical and theoretical equivalence. And so um, one form is uh, much more easier to interpret than another. And so we'll start with the beta naught term or our intercept or beta sub zero. Um, and so this is when all our predictors are zero. It's the logged average um, of our dependent variable. Um, and e to the power of our intercept is the average y value. Um, and when it comes to interpreting the rest of our beta weights, so that means like normal regression controlling for all our other predictors, an increase in um, x1 by one unit, uh, beta one is the expected change, this time in the logged average of our dependent variable. Um, and e to the power of beta one is the multiplicative change in the average y value. And I'll expand more on what that means later. Um, so really the only, the, the only really big change here, I guess, is um, adding log um, to before average y value. Um, but we'll now look at a hypothetical example. So let's say we have this formula. Um, so we interpret the intercept as reflecting the trends in anti-discrimination laws in historically Democrat states um, with zero urban population. Um, so we expect the log number of laws in such states to be two. Um, to make this more interpretable, we expect historically Democrat states um, with zero urban population to have around 7.4 anti-discrimination laws. Since if we take e to the power of two, which is like 2.74 or something, right? 2.74 to the power of two is around uh, 7.389. And so this will become important later because when actually when you have to specify your priors and stay in GLM, um, you'll need to do this sort of conversion. Um, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, when it comes to the urban percentage coefficient, so beta one equals 0.03. This means that we expect the log number of laws to increase by 0.03 for every extra percentage point increase in the urban population. Um, again it's easy, more easily interpreted on the unlogged scale. So when we do that, and we have our number 1.03 on the unlogged scale, um, this represents uh, the percentage change um, for every increase, every one unit increase in X. Um, so in this example, um, if the urban population in a state is 1% greater than another state, we'd expect it to have 1.03 times the number of anti-discrimination laws. Um, this is more easily uh, said as having 3% more anti-discrimination laws. Um, the take-home point being that it represents the percentage change or multiplicative increase rather than the additive increase, which we get from normal regression. Lastly, uh, we'll yeah, interpret... Yeah, excuse me. Can, can I say... Uh... Can I say 97 less percent? Uh, 97 less. Like um, when it's more than one, so you have one times um, uh, point no three. Um, so a number that's greater than one, can I say just uh, uh, the, the, the other part of the percentage? The, so not 3%, but 97% less? Um, Maybe. Oh. I'm, I'm asking you because I, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, others are welcome to chime in here. Um, I guess, I guess so what's you correct? could. What's the best, the best say? To, because if you say 3%, this is uh, one time more and uh, and 3% three, 3%. So one, one time plus. Uh, uh, so um, is that usually uh, said like the, the, the other side of the, 
the percentage mentioning the decreasing mm -hmm. uh, right if we were to go, the unit if it were to decrease that would be 97 percent um I, i'm i'm asking because um um i'm not sure what what's the correct way to to say um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah oh. I, Oh yeah, go ahead, Olivia. Uh, let's see. No, I have just like try her. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Can I just uh, let me? Can I copy past that? Copy. I copy past the result on the chat. Maybe it will make stuff clear. So this is just R, and I just do the exponential of minus uh, 0.03, and it's 97 percent, like you assume, uh, Frederica. If it's what you want to say. If I understand correctly, like if you want to see like um, the coefficient, we'll have to check. Beta one will be like minus 0.03, and if it's minus 0.03, you have to decrease. Uh, that's kind like 97 percent. I don't know if it's answer your question. It's it's a uh, it's exactly the same, exactly the same thing. Okay, if you yeah. say 90 percent, 97 percent less, so three percent more. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you <laughs> exactly. change if you change the time, yes. This is the exponential is um, yeah symmetric. Yeah. I, if I understand correctly, I can do like the other one, like also, uh, and past it. Here. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know, but uh, yeah. No, I'm asking because uh, th there is a way uh, to express this uh, this result. So when it's over uh, the the hundred percent, so over the the uh, over the hundred percent, and when it's less the hundred percent, so uh, you express it in this way so you can say it's one time 0.3 more or 97 percent less right no i think that I, i'm asking i'm asking because yeah. I, I if i don't remember no i think I, I think like if you you have to multiply by uh 103 or this is it this is like uh it, it can only be what because like it's in a um uh this uh the rates um, depend of uh, beta one, and if beta one is positive, by the way it works, it it will increase it. If it's negative, it will decrease it. So, yeah, yeah. But in in biostatistics, for example, so when when you express these values, it, it's yeah. exactly the same to say it's one time point three more. Than expected, or ninety-seven percent less. Okay. Yeah. I'm an, instead, I'm you, that word, but... yeah. Instead, if you have a value which is lower than one, so like yeah. you have, I don't know, fifty-five. Okay. Yeah. Then you say it's fifty-five percent more. No, it's less. <laughs> if I understand, okay, let, let, let's write that's an okay. example. That's that's okay. Yeah. That's a but, silly thing. But, that's a, that's there's <laughs> a bit. There's a bit later on, isn't there, about the fifty-four percent or something, isn't there? I think that's that's probably coming later. I think. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Just well, maybe we can figure an example, no? Yeah. Yeah. It will, it will be better. So yeah. um, let's. Uh, I, Um, okay, yeah, I think I get what you're saying. Um, okay. Like, especially when it comes to odds ratios, like if it's less than one, then it's, um, yeah, it, it, like event B would be more likely um, compared to if it's greater than one, then event A would be more likely. Um, but yeah, maybe we can discuss it later if we have time. Um, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, 
but we'll move on to um, things I can maybe offer more insight on, which is <laughs> interpreting um, the categorical coefficients. Um, so for this one, the beta weight is negative 1.1. Um, so since it is categorical, we have to interpret it relative to the reference category, which again is the Democrat leaning states. So on the log scale, um, it serves as the difference between the GOP versus Democrat model lines. Um, this means that at any urban percentage, we expect the log number of laws to be 1.1 uh, lower or 1.1 times lower um, in historically GOP states compared to Democrat states. Um, on the nonlinear uh, lambda scale, the difference between slopes isn't constant. Um, so the gap widens as the urban percentage increases as was shown um, earlier here. Um, so instead of representing the constant difference between two lines, if we raise e to the power of negative 1.1, it measures the percentage or again, the multiplicative difference between GOP and Democrat curves um, at any um, urban percentage level. We'd expect a historically um, red state to have a third as many anti-discrimination laws as historically Democrat states which we can show or which we can get by raising e to the power of um, our beta weight. So takeaways from all of this. Uh, so Poisson regression handles our dependent variable by putting it on the log scale. This allows us to still express um, y as a linear combination of our x's or predictors. Um, however, this means that the beta coefficients can be interpreted on the log or unlog scale um, where they represent multiple multiplicative change rather than additive changes. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Or did I make any mistakes there? Feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, but now we'll discuss the Poisson regression assumptions, which we've, we've touched on a few already. Um, but for the structure of the data, um, we assume that given our predictors, our dependent variable um, is independent of the other um, individual observations. Um, we assume the response variable is a discrete count of events. Um, so other examples other than anti-discrimination laws could be, say, if you're trying to predict the number of crimes someone may commit in a period of time. Um, that's sort of my area of research, which is why it comes to mind. Um, or the structure of the relationship. So that for this assumption, um, the logged average dependent variable is a linear combination of our predictors. And the big assumption, um, which makes Poisson pretty much like a good teaching point, but I don't know if anyone else has used Poisson regression in there. Um, in yeah, I use it pretty life. bad. Yeah, <laughs> it makes a pretty it's restricted very bad. assumption. Yeah, yeah. it's very okay. bad at, um, if you have extreme cases. Exactly, which is why um, we'll um, go to the negative binomial later, um, but it assumes that uh, for your distribution, there's equal mean and variance. Um, actually, I wonder, is there like, could you do a formal hypothesis test of that? I would imagine so. Um, but anyways, you could think of just in any example um, that this usually isn't the case. Uh, so the left image shows equal mean and variance. So your distribution might look like this. However, the right shows a violation of this assumption. Um, just so you can see what it might look like visually. Yeah, this is counterintuitive, no? It is, yeah. I had to look at it again, make sure that the authors didn't actually switch the good and not good uh, titles. Yeah, because uh, just, just from normal regression, when I did it like 20 years ago, that, yeah, that is the wrong way around, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I didn't do uh, Poisson regression then at all. So, I mean, I'm sure this will be right for this, but I think it was called, is it heteroscedacity or something? um where the variance changes over the um regression line right when the residuals aren't um yeah e evenly distributed right yeah yeah um, but yeah it's not because like the variance have to follow the mean i mean right um yeah so when it comes to the next step which is and I, now we're actually getting into um, Bayesian stats. Uh, up until this point, I think we're just talking about um, Poisson regression. Um, but there are, 
Yeah. Now there are some there are additional considerations, as I mentioned before, um, how to specify your priors. Um, so it's more or less the same. However, there is a, a bit of extra thinking involved. So um, our beta weights for this toy example, um, they can take on any value on the real number line. So we can use normal priors, um, which we can represent like so. Um, but consider the uh, prior for the centered intercept. Um, you'll recall that our prior assumption that the average number of laws in typical states is around seven. Um, oh, I don't know if I mentioned that, but that's um, what the average is. Um, as such, we set the normal prior mean to be two because on the log scale, we take the log of seven, it's around two or 1.95. So you just have to remember to do this calculation when specifying your priors in this sort of way. Um, further, the range of this normal prior indicates our relative uncertainty about this baseline. So you'll see that it's 0.5 squared. Again, this will depend on um, your particular case, um, but this is considered a pretty wide variance because um, we're not certain about what the range of values could be. Um, we think that the average number of laws in typical states might be around um, seven and ranges between three and 20. However, since we have to specify the logged average again, um, we input it um, the mean is two with a range of around one to three. Um, and we use weekly informative default priors um, with larger standard deviations, again, to reflect our uncertainty, which can be expressed like so. Um, however, uh, one thing worth noting is that the textbook is using outdated code. So if any of you work through these examples, have you done so, Olivier? Um, it, it gives you uh, an error. I'm too yeah. busy now, but I will do it, yeah. Oh, it's all good. Yeah, I didn't even have the time to do the homework on this one, which I should have since I'm presenting. But anyways, um, the old code uses add fitting draws, and it'll tell you that this function is now deprecated. I think they said it, it was confusing to users. Um, so the right one um, when you're simulating um, your prior is to use add ePred draws. Um, I think with that, good catch. Yeah. Um, and you'll see that um, when we're simulating the posterior, um, we'll have to use um, possibly an, another function, um, but I think we'll um, go through that later. Another thing to note is that, um, yeah, I commented here um, that dot value now needs to be changed to dot epred. Um, so these are, this is the dependent value that you're trying to simulate. Um, you probably won't remember this from this presentation, right? Um, if you remember this presentation at all by the end of the day. Um, I so remember. Just make sure. <laughs> all right, thanks Olivia. Uh, so if you look up um, the documentation, either for add fitted draws, it'll tell you it's deprecated and it'll give you the alternatives, but just so you, um, yeah. everyone. I think value is misleading. So I understand why they change it to pre expe expectation prediction. That's something like right. that. Right, okay, yeah, that's what it stands for. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think on e -pred. E -pred ex yeah. expected prediction, but maybe I'm wrong. No, I think that makes sense. Uh, and value yeah. can be very misleading. So yeah, right. makes sense. Yeah. And so this is what we do to actually get to simulate our priors. And this is what it looks like visually. Again, to reflect our uncertainty, you can see that the lines are going every which way. Um, but um, well then, we go to the next stage, which is simulating the posterior. Um, and so this is what it looks like. And as you can tell, so this is our actual data in dark navy blue. Um, our posterior simulations do a much better job this time compared to the normal regression. As you can tell from both of these plots, um, it mimics the shape and distribution. Okay, so now when it comes to interpreting the posterior, um, well, now we can do it because we've approximated um, the, the data pretty well. Um, so swing now, is bad, no? This? Yeah, swing is bad, no? I don't know. Oh, yeah. No, it, it is. I think they'll, they'll okay. touch on that later. But you're right. Yeah, when you look at these credible intervals, there are quite a few that fall outside the range. That's a good catch. Yeah. Um, we can... Um, use the tidy function to get um, all of our um, credible intervals and estimates. And so 
we can also represent it with the following equations. So just take these numbers and slot them in here, and then we'll interpret each of them. Um, so for the percent um, Irving coefficient, and the posterior median is 0 0.0164. Um, so we can interpret this as controlling or holding constant for historical voting trends. Uh, we expect the log number of anti-discrimination laws in states to increase by 0 0.0164 uh, for every extra percentage point in urban population. Um, again, more helpful on the unlogged scale, we expect a 1.65% um, increase of more anti-discrimination laws with every 1% increase in urban population. Um, so now I'll give a quick quiz that was found in the textbook. So the posterior median here um, for beta three, so that's comparing swing states to Democrat states, it's roughly mm -hmm. around negative 0.61. Um, correspondingly, that's 0 0.54 on the unlogged scale. How can we interpret this value when holding constant percent urban? Is it A, um, the number of anti-discrimination laws tends to decrease by roughly 54% for every extra swing state? B, swing states tend to have 54% as many anti-discrimination laws as Democrat-leaning states? Or C, swing states uh, tend to have 0.54 fewer anti-discrimination laws than Democrat-leaning states? Um, I won't call people out, but feel free to either chime in if you want or put it in the chat. Yeah, uh, I will see. Could be wrong. I I, I kind of um, got a pin and, and stuck it in. I think it was B, but I, oh. I, 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 I wouldn't stake my life on it. Me neither. It's, <laughs> it's okay. That's why we're here. Frederica, Frederica, your bet, your bet. <laughs> You can you can choose A, so it's certain at least one person has <laughs> got it right. <laughs> Which one? Uh, it's all right. You can also stay on mute. Unlike Olivia, I don't call. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Anyway. Uh, what music? So which one? <laughs> But I said B, maybe. Okay, okay I'm gonna do it now. <laughs> you switch your answer. <laughs> um, but anyways, so to key, the key to uh, getting this answer is recognizing that the categorical swing state indicator uh, uh, provides comparing um, to Democrat states at, um, or at the state level. Um, so yeah, that makes B right. So comparing yeah. it to all Democrat leaning states. Um, so we see that here. So they tend to have um, 54% as many anti-discrimination laws as Democrat in the states. Um, lastly, we can do a bit of hypothesis testing. Um, this is supposed to say hour. So look at our 80% credible intervals. Um, I don't know why they chose, uh, I, I think they did a bit of hacking here. So I think the convention is 95% credible intervals. I think if you run this with 95%, it's you won't get statistically significant differences. I could be wrong, but anyways. Um, our percent urban, so we can see here that our percent urban coefficient is statistically significant because like within frequentist traditions, um, it doesn't overlap with zero here, percent urban. Um, barely doesn't overlap with zero. Um, when controlling first states historical political means, um, there's a significant um, positive association between number of anti-discrimination laws and the percentage of people in urban settings. Um, also, lastly, when controlling for states percent um, of urban makeup, um, the number of anti-discrimination laws in GOP leaning states and swing states tend to be significantly below Democrat leaning states. Um, as you can see here, again, they don't overlap with zero. Um, but so in next, states, clearly, what, what's the answer? So it is. It is oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I was sorry, wrong. I just didn't explain it. But no, yeah, I was big. <laughs> no, but I mean the book. I mean in the book. 
Right, yeah, they don't clearly specify. I'm pretty sure it's B, though. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Olivia was right this entire time. No, 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 it makes sense, like, it's missing. Yeah. Yeah, plus um, 0.54 fewer anti-discrimination laws, um, I yeah. think is right, because it needs to be on the percentage or a multiplicative yeah. scale, um, but yeah. Um, okay, so now that we've done all of that, um, some people might not even be interested in estimating or doing any hypothesis uh, testing, but uh, we can focus on posterior prediction. Um, so to explore how the general Poisson model plays out in individual states, um, we can look at Minnesota as a case study. Um, we can see how well our model does in predicting the number of anti-discriminatory laws Minnesota has. Um, so this is a historically very blue state um, with 73% of residents um, living in urban areas, um, and they have four anti-discrimination laws, um, as we can see here. Um, but interestingly, um, when we use our uh, model to try and predict the number of anti-discrimination laws for Minnesota, we see that um, it's quite off. So um, you can see some of the predictions here, 20, 17, 21. Um, and so the resulting posterior predictive model anticipates Minnesota to have roughly between 10 and 30 anti-discrimination laws, um, range yeah. that's far higher than the actual number of laws. Um, so for a state with such a high urban population and being historically blue, um, it has an unusually fewer small number of anti-discrimination laws. Again, doesn't say anything about how anti-discriminatory Minnesota is because number of laws is doesn't equate to the quality. However, um, this is uh, very interesting to look at. And so the posterior predictive model of the number of anti-discrimination laws in Minnesota um, is shown here. And so rather than simulating the posterior predictive model for Minnesota, um, we can also do this. Um, we can also predict the number of laws from a state um, using the posterior plausible parameters that we estimated. And so we can just plug them all into this equation, um, which is shown here. Um, and then transform the log um, to obtain the unlogged average number of laws in states like Minnesota, yeah. um, and then uh, simulate the outcome for the number of laws um, in that state using the R Poisson or random Poisson function. Um, yeah, we, we don't have to walk through the code here, but um, it's, that's demonstrated in the textbook. Um, just another note on Minnesota. Um, it's interesting. Um, we also removed an outlier, which is California, which I can't remember. They had a crazy number of anti-discriminatory laws, like, I don't know, it was like 40 or 50 or something like that. Um, oh, I thought, so I wonder... I thought it was like about 155. It was, it oh, was yeah, really 155. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. California is something I, else. I think like a good prediction of the number would be the number of law passed. Like uh, just some states like to pass low and some like, you know, like you said, like, it's low are not the only way to fight discrimination. And you can have states that historically use low, but some others that use as a mean. Right. So yeah. I don't know. I think, yeah, low, it makes sense to check the, I mean, the number of low, but the number of low, like, I don't know, maybe also like red states tend to have less low for everything, not just like anti-discrimination, like less low for driving, less low for whatever. So they pass less low, simply. Right, tend to be more neoliberal in that sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, no, it could definitely be the case. And it just made me think about, you know, one, if we included California, how would this affect our predictions for Minnesota? Because, um, well, I just wonder, um, when, you, when it comes to incorporating, um, if we had more informative priors, because remember we use weekly informative, um, how that would affect our predictions as well. So just all things to consider um, in doing well, Bayesian so data analysis and how priors handle outliers or how they can maybe attenuate their effects. Sorry, go. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a while since I've been following the Senate elections in the US, but Minnesota isn't that much of a democratic state because it had a Republican senator at the time. And, right. and then the Democrat won. And then I think he got kicked out of the Senate for doing bad things. 
Uh, but yeah, it, it's not a completely rock solid Democrat said, uh, state. Right. Okay. Yeah. I don't keep up with American politics then as you probably figured out or not too much, but um, uh, that's a good point. Um, yeah. I, don't, I just know. Um, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say something that's completely irrelevant. Let's move on. I'll try to keep the politics to a minimum <laughs> on this recorded presentation. Um, but anyways, we'll now move on to model evaluation. Um, so the they give us a few questions consistently throughout this textbook to look at. So how fair is our model? Um, so they just go through quickly um, to be careful not to generalize since this is looking at things from the state level to generalize it to individuals um, and to conclude how anti-discriminatory maybe certain uh, individuals may be. Um, and as far as we can tell, there's no bias in the data collection process. Um, we can also look at how wrong is our model, which we've looked at several times now with our posterior predictive check and visually comparing our data to our model. Um, and then lastly, and what we'll dive into more now, is how accurate are our model predictions? Um, and so we can analyze this by examining uh, the number of, or we can analyze this by examining the posterior predictive models for each state in the data set. And I think this is very informative because now we can look at, as Olivier already anticipated, that when it comes to swing states, our model tends to not do as well because you can see they tend to be outside of our credible intervals. Yeah, and this is probably Minnesota, like one of the, um the uh, like the one around like 73 per 73.3 like the the blue dots uh below like the um, on the dem one you have like a blue dot that's uh, way way below like the um, uh, credible interval yeah this one this one is probably minnesota i don't know i yeah. think so it, yeah, it should be like guess. around 20 and it's four <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah which is exactly what we discussed in the previous slide the exact yeah. around 20 ish so no that's right yeah and so our model um overall it does better anticipating laws in gop states um than in democrat or swing states um we can get a summary of our predictions with the um ooh, this isn't right i think there's an underscore here a prediction summary function um in the textbook i'll try not to read verbatim but it gives a certain um, evaluation of how our model does. Um, actually, I guess I'll, I'll read some of it because it's worth discussing in a bit more detail. And I recognize we're a bit short on time. Um, but across the 49 states in our study, the observed number of anti-discrimination laws tends to fall um, only around 3.4 laws or 1.3 posterior standard deviations from their posterior mean predictions. So given the range of the number of state laws, um, which ranges from one to 38, a typical prediction error of 3.4 is pretty good, or that's what they're telling us. Um, but on the flip side, um, the observed number of laws for only around 70% of the states fall within their 95% um, um, posterior prediction intervals. This means that our posterior predictive models missed um, around 22% or 11 of the 49 states. Um, so, so when it comes good, to no? 11 of 49, yeah, so that's uh, a good and interesting statement to, uh, to start this discussion because for me, when I saw this, I think 22%, that's not too bad, um, but I guess it really depends on um, sort of in your field, it's considered pretty good. Yeah. And and I mean, a quarter of it is outside of the potential, that's what they mean, of the, of the posterior predict prediction interval. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. a, a huge range of interval. And then if yeah. like, I don't know, because mm -hmm. the ninety-five percent one is is really quite big. And if you look at the within fifty, they've only got um, thirty-three percent within within the fifty. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I mean, yeah. You are like basically trying to predict the number of law passed with the percentage of your urban, uh, urban percentage error and just the last election poll. Uh, so I don't know. I don't think it's good enough predict predictor. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. Right. 
No, and I would definitely um, agree with that argument. Um, just some things to keep note of, like when they say that our model missed 22 percent of states. I mean, I say it may or may not be good. I think um, the majority of this room thinks it's pr pretty much not good. Um, but at least for me, I would like to see relative to other models, um, in addition to quantifying by how much our model missed each of these states, right? Because we're doing I mean, this sort of binary decision like, making. I would like also like, you know, this currently we are all in the realm of statistic. I'm not a political uh, science people, so I don't know like uh, their stuff, but uh, I will need more like, uh, solid science behind that because it looks like we are just pulling out like you know the idea like people in city tend to be more lgbtq friendly than people in rural area i i assume it's true in the us maybe but um i think like it's need you know we are just doing statistic where we should also like obviously uh try to uh have other grounds to attack this problem and not only statistic, like, you know, some people uh, from anthropology or other disciplines that will go uh, and speak to people. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good point um, that you need to bring in um, a lot of theoretical um, justification yeah. for everything that we do. Yeah. Um, Pervading theme in statistics, I think. Um, and then but it's lastly, statistic books are fair. I mean, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a toy example. I would have to bet that none of the authors are political scientists either. Um, but yeah. Uh, but anyways, um, this is just an example showing that um, when we do cross validation, it doesn't seem overfit just because when we look at the mean absolute error um, and all the other statistics, it's pretty comparable um, to um, to what we got here. I'm just doing just looking at it very briefly. Okay, so now we'll go into, and I'll, I think I can skim through this pretty quickly, the negative binomial regression. So this is useful, as we already mentioned earlier, when um, your variance is much greater than your mean. And since with any right skewed distribution that you'll get in real life, this is probably the case, um, it just makes more sense to use the negative binomial regression. However, the Poisson was a good starting point to just lay the foundations for, you know, interpreting um, the log and all of that stuff. Um, so we see that um, this is for a different example. So they're trying to predict the number of books someone reads based on whether they prefer to be wise but unhappy or happy but unwise. I thought that was pretty funny or pretty uh, interesting example, um, as well as using people's age. Um, so some basic descriptive stats. We see when we try to fit a Poisson regression, um, this is our simulation. It doesn't approximate it very well, namely yeah. because the mean and variance, it's symmetric, first of all, first off, versus this is much more right tail skewed and the center of the distribution is just um, off. And so we try to account for this over dispersion. So that's when the variance is much greater than the mean with the negative binomial. Um, I just have here the probability mass function um, this is how you get the mean invariance. Um, and we use this model instead, which results in much better um, overlap between our model and the data set. Um, I don't know if any of this is actual real data or if they just simulated all of it, but I think they find pretty good examples where it's like the model does like really well. <laughs> Anyways. Um, no, I, have, I, have, I have seen people in epidemiology like use the negative binomial to uh, more like. Uh... Mm -hmm. Uh, better, better fits usually. For sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, same in my field. I've yet to see a Poisson regression, and yeah, negative binomial is just the way to go for these problems. I think it's a takeaway here. Um, oh, for special data, Poisson is still relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, do I have one more slide? Yes. So just to get through this in the last thirty seconds. Um, Generalized linear models. So this is the sort of the theme where we've introduced GLMs for the first time, right? Uh, and so they generalize ordinary linear regression um, by pretty much allowing the linear model to relate to our outcome variable with the length function. And so we'll have to use this whenever our dependent variable um, isn't exactly continuous um, or you know tailor made for our um, ordinary linear regression. And so in this case, we looked at Poisson negative binomial. 
However, it extends to logistic. Um, help me out, what other <laughs> GLMs are there? Actually, those are the only three I could think of. Um, but I'm sure there are many others. And so um, it can there, be expressed. There's a the list in the reading, isn't there? I'm sure there was. I can't remember precisely what they were, but, th but there's a list. Oh, it, there? There's a list somewhere in there, isn't there? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's true. I remember they said, you know, we're not going to cover all of them, we'll cover the most important ones. Um, but there are many, um, probably because there are many functions you can apply to your dependent variable, right? Or many um, uh, transformations you can apply um, in order to um, accommodate your data structure, as it were. And so the last thing I'll say is that the normal regression model uh, applies an identity link function, which is where you essentially do nothing to the mean that you're trying to model. Um, and that's it. And so for next week, we'll extend our journey and look at logistic regression as our next GLM. This is weird, I'm doing that, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Whoa. Yeah. So that's that a big one. one. Yeah, yeah, it was good. I think like, um, um, yeah, it make, uh, I think you made a good point uh, explaining like all of that. And so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't read it, so I think you let me when I'm, I'm going to read it. Yeah, when you read it, you can correct me next week on everything I said wrong. No, but, no, I, appreciate, but, uh, I appreciate everyone's input. I thought this was a good discussion. Well, it was I, I did read it. It was definitely related to what, we're, what what was in the book. So well done. Great. Okay. Um, that's good. So yeah, uh, yeah. At the end, so Ellen is natural logarithm. So we're good. It was it was that. Uh, it was explained at the end. Yeah, um, Ellen. So if you do log, it means they stand. Usually means natural logarithm. I have no idea what it is, but <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> the the base but the base is exponential. That's all I know. Instead of two or ten, which uh, I agree. Different. I agree. Yeah. I know just the exponential is stay there. But uh, yeah, and sure, and sure, I I think the log in R is uh is the this one too. So. Uh, I think you're right. So we have to check that. But yeah. Okay. So I think we are progressing now slowly. Yeah, we're doing good. I think. Yeah. So congratulations, everyone. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, sure. So we'll good luck for next week. Like, well, yeah, we'll do that too. Yeah. Let so good. Uh, are you still with us, Brendan, uh, or do you have a meeting? I don't remember. Yeah, so I'll be 15 minutes late, I think, consistently. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, well, I'll, I'll be here. You know, we are just we are speaking cooking, and we had any more in America before, so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, you're right. Okay, well, so guys, see you next week. And, Take care. Uh, Bye. And thanks for the presentation. Great. Yeah. Right, well done, thank man. you. Yeah. Good seeing everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.